God. Ned, Ned gave a wonderful talk, but given today, I don't think what either Ned or I say is going to actually be in many people's memories about what happened today. However, choosing what to do next is a universal struggle for all creative enterprises. And being a physicist simply defines one very broad field of engagement in the struggle. Considering how important the choice of research problems is, astonishing little time is given to this issue in university education. Today, I will describe some of my own experiences of finding problems. I urge you to think about your own science choices. I believe that your choice of research problem is the primary determinant of what you will actually accomplish in science. That's one. In an article in The Guardian in 2015, the playwright David Hare remarked, it's hindsight that makes things look in inevitable. I want to write a memoir to illustrate how purely life depends on chance. He then went on to describe how he became a playwright. He was at the time a young director, strong political, political bent. He'd never conceived of himself as an author. But an inspiring author failed to produce a, prom a promised script. Hare stepped in and wrote his first play in four days. The play, the play became the play for his troupe of actors, which had already been hired, to play the next week in the theater, which he had also already hired. David Hare's choice to write that play, which turned out to be successful, launched his highly successful career as a playwright. I've published more to, in diverse scientific directions than many scientists do. Accidences and coincidences often seem to be the dominant factor in my choice of topics, particularly for the more significant papers I have written. The same could be said of Hare's plots and, and characters. Of course, Pasteur remarked, chance favors only the prepared mind. But the interplay between new random incidents and one's previous accumulated experience that really matters. Previous, previous experience often comes to you highly structured. But what parcels of experience we receive and retain or understand and what we reject is also just very whimsical. I describe the issue of problem choice as though there were a well-defined list of problems and one is merely choosing say problem number 437 and there is only one good answer. In my experience, the best problems are actually constructed on the fly, evolving in the process of research and what is considered good depends strongly on the scientific culture of the community to whom the work is presented. The world is immense, complex, diverse. Given one's experience, what is a science problem? How do you find an interesting tiny chunk of experience carved from the immensity of all the experience available to us? A tiny chunk to isolate, explain, and understand. The question is not unlike that faith fed hair to trying to say, what is the plot of a play? Looking at the human condition, how do you isolate a small chunk of it to comment on in a play? Ah. But what I have often done reflects my willingness to accept the influence of chance events to allow events rather than an overarching plan of my career to determine what I actually do. My mother and father were both physicists. This background led me to a quite different feeling on the subject. As a child, I loved to take things apart and understand how they worked. I tried to understand how a string of Christmas lights all went out when one was removed. Or 
Look, a rubber band heats up when it gets stretched. Why does that happen? How does thunder come about? All of these are parts of physics. Physics is the point of view that anything of this sort with effort, ingenuity, and adequate resources could be understood in predictive and reasonably quantitative fashion. Physics from this point of view is not a subject, but a philosophy of approach to doing science. My thesis professor liked to find paradoxes, places where things which he expected to be related were in fact contradictory. Then he had found a chink in his understanding of the world, and that was a place to begin. So L. Over, L. Overhauser told me briefly about a few of these things that he was looking at because they were things he didn't understand. I didn't understand any of them because I didn't know enough solid state physics to know anything about why was there a contradiction between points of view. Only one of the problems could I even grasp at all? And I said, maybe I'll think about that one. It was a happy choice because it was a problem which Overhauser had never actually given very serious thought to, nor did he do so while I struggled. He was a marvelous sounding board for my ideas. The great gift he came, gave to me was a question. The fact that he did not know how to approach it and it was allowing me to construct a problem and to write a scientific paper. I try to pay him back through helping my students in that fashion when I can. Well, I went to Bill Labs next. I floundered a bit because Al had helped me find a problem by pointing me to an area, but I didn't know how to find a, I still didn't know how to find a problem. And it wasn't until I went around and talked to many experimental laboratories that I began to see how I could find problems for me, who was interested in understanding in the, how the simple facts of condensed matter physics, solid state physics came about. I spent about 10 years of, of doing this. First, in, in working on theory problems where the first order understanding was not yet known. They were the puzzles which I found most intriguing and required the least of mathematization. And as theorists go, I'm not the greatest mathematician. After about 10 years of doing this, however, the problems I had been attracted to in the field seemed to me to be running out. There were more and more problems, there were more and more detailed problems. So I was looking for a new area of problems. I went on a Guggenheim to the Cavendish Laboratory for half a year, didn't find anything of real help. Went back to Princeton and Bell Labs where I was sort of going back and forth. And Bob Schulman, known for years, was a chemist who was working in the NMR of biomolecules. And it was a great time. It was a time when a few proteins were now sequenced, when a few proteins had their structures known, when NMR was beginning to tell you details of particular sites in proteins, where some proteins like hemoglobin and myoglobin had all kinds of physical techniques that you could bring to measure the properties, the interesting properties of the protein. But the interesting thing which Shulman brought to my attention was that it wasn't just structure and properties. Solid state physics was structure and properties. Biology had this unique notion of function. Chemistry doesn't have the notion. Geology doesn't have the function. Have the function have the, have, doesn't have a meaning for the term. Engineering and biology do. And it's the functional properties that you're really interested in, even though function is somehow somewhat ill-defined. So Bob had found a functional problem in which many people were working on in hemoglobin and hemoglobin was really my introduction in how to do physics in a biological system. But as you can see, um, my fundamental interest was not understanding biology yet. It was just biology had complex 
complicated systems with interesting functional properties and you had to use function in your, in your definition of what was worth pursuing. In the spring of 1974, I taught my first biophysics course. The first half of it was really all about hemoglobin, equilibrium properties of hemoglobin, structure, physical measurements in, and so on and so on. The nice thing about hemoglobin is the most interesting functional property is the equilibrium property and thus relatively easy to talk about from a physics viewpoint. But biology is really about dynamical systems. In equilibrium, you're not just dead, you're spread uniformly thinly across the surface of the earth. And so I had in this course to introduce something about biological dynamics, kinetics and biological systems. I looked at my lecture notes, they didn't exist beyond the first half on hemoglobin. I needed to find a problem quickly. I was rather in the hair position. I had this lecture room, reasonable number of bright physics students in it who had some knowledge of chemistry, no knowledge of biology, and who had been told, you're going to hear about biological dynamics next week. That weekend, I quickly did a speed reading of the Leninger textbook, textbook and found in it a problem. Thing, that's right. The problem had, had two features. It almost was no chemistry because it didn't involve nu great nuclear motions. It involved moving an electron from one place to another place and everything else changed, changing fairly still. And so it, you didn't have to know huge amounts of physics to get to it. In fact, the semiconductor physics I knew had already led me to understand exactly what to do to tackle that problem. And it didn't really demand much in the way of knowledge of chemistry, so the students were already reasonably equipped. And so this, considering the background and talents of me and my students, it was a good match to, to a problem. Parenthetically, knowing that a problem is important is not adequate reason in my mind to pursue it. You really need to consider your, your background and talents and whether they can be linked to the problem usefully. Well, I talked biological electron transfer I wrote a paper on it as a result of having found by looking at the literature, the discussions of it in the, bio, in the biological literature are fundamentally nonsense. The paper had a modest success for about seven years. And then at that point I was at uh, Caltech and two very good graduate students grabbed hold of the problem and rushed off and did marvelous things with it. And they did it because they had talents, which I didn't have. Talents are running big computer programs. They really understood chemistry and the structure of molecules in a way that I just really did not know biochemistry. And it so often happens, your solve problem paper is a starting point for next generation, which comes to it with a completely different set of tools and different purpose to what it's trying to do. How's my time doing? Um, John, you're around done, <laughs> uh, time-wise. But if you have any last words of wisdom, we'd love to I hear. Know. We're going to just talk about one brief little thing, okay. and that was um, proofreading. That was actually developed for the same course, not as a subject. I worked on the kinetics of binding of ligands and the question of trying to make a biological site which could discriminate between two, two closely related ligands. Given a very el elementary view of how to make a binding pocket, I could only make a crude estimate of how discriminating biology might be. My estimate was, ah, maybe you could distinguish between one part and 40 of two very similar amino acids. The real numbers, experimental, one in 4,000 maybe. 
I said, I must have made a horrible estimate. But the problem niggled after, after I gave up teaching for the semester. I finally thought, I can't be as bad as that. There must be some way of bootstrapping yourself up. And if you proofread macroscopically, you can get error rates of typing, which are normally very bad for me, up to making only one error per page. And once you have the idea of a proofreading might be a microscopic phenomenon. You're completely off in another ballpark. And it was just, it just that one little breakthrough that said there's a problem, a conflict between two things, and it could be resolved if proofreading was existed in biology. And that also turns out to be the case. I will say more about it. But two of my most important papers both new papers in the field for me that they were in came directly out of trying to give a course on a subject which I didn't really, wasn't really accurately prepared to give. Let me close with just a remark that, um, a question for you. What general advice do you give to a young PhD seeking something to work on? Thank you.